Friends, my name is Nizamuddin Ahmed Siddiqui and I am an assistant professor of law at West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. I will be taking this unit on inherent limits to the enjoyment of fundamental rights on behalf of the content writer Pallavi Kota, assistant professor Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Law College, Andhra University. This unit aims to fulfill certain learning objectives which include number one appreciating the relationship between directive principles of state policy and fundamental rights number two learning about the reasonable restrictions given under fundamental rights and number three an appreciation of the view of judiciary in explaining the limits of fundamental rights given under the constitution. With these learning objectives, let us begin. Let us first examine the way directive principles of state policy sets out limitations on fundamental rights. The constitution which lays down the basic structure of a nation's polity is built on the foundations of certain fundamental values. The vision of our founding fathers and the aims and objectives which they wanted to achieve through the constitution are contained in the preamble, the fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy. The relationship between fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy came up before the Supreme Court in the case of state of Madras versus Champakam Durai Rajan. The court said, the directive principles have to confirm to and run subsidiary to the chapter on fundamental rights. Later, in the fundamental rights case, the majority opinion reflected the view that what is fundamental in the governance of the country cannot be less significant than what is significant for the life of an individual. Another judge constituting the majority in that case said, in building up a just social order, it is some, sometimes imperative that the fundamental rights should be subordinated to directive principles. This view that the fundamental rights and directive principles are complementary, neither part being superior to the other has held the field since. The directive principles have through important constitutional amendments become the benchmark to insulate legislation enacted to achieve social objectives which are enumerated in some of the directive principles from attacks of invalidation by the courts. This way legislation for achieving agrarian reforms and specifically for achieving the objectives of article 39 b and c of the constitution have been immunized from challenge as to the violation of the right to equality under article 14 the freedom of speech and expression under article 19 and others however even here the court has retained its power of judicial review to examine if in fact the legislation is intended to achieve the objective of article 39 b and c and where the legislation is an amendment to the constitution whether it violates the basic structure of the constitution the supreme court recognized basic structure doctrine for the first time in the historic case of Keshavananda Bharati versus Union of India. The Supreme Court declared that article 368 did not enable parliament to alter the basic structure of framework of the constitution and parliament could not use its amending powers under article 368 to damage, emasculate, destroy, abrogate, change or alter the basic structure or framework of the constitution. Let us now try and examine the limitations given under fundamental rights of the constitution. 
the fundamental rights guaranteed under article 19.1 are not absolute. They are subject to restrictions placed in the subsequent clauses of article 19. No restrictions by mere executive or departmental instructions can be placed. They would not be a law which the state is entitled to make under the relevant clauses 2 to 6 of article 19 to regulate or curtail fundamental rights under article 19 1. Clauses 2 to 6 of article 19 do not require the making of a law solely for placing the restrictions mentioned in them. The test of reasonableness mentioned in postulated of the restrictions in clauses 2 to 6 of article 19 should be applied to each individual statute impugned and no abstract standard or general principle can be applicable to all the cases. The reasonableness of the restraint would have to be judged by the magnitude of the evil which it is the purpose of the restraint to curb or to eliminate. The expression in the interests of in clauses 2 to 6 of article 19 makes the ambit of the protection very wide for a law may not have been designed to directly maintain public order or to directly protect the public against any evil and yet it may have been enacted in the interests of public order of the public. The words public order appearing in clauses 2 and 4 of article 19 must have the same meaning. In clause 2, public order is virtually synonymous with public peace, safety and tranquility. The denotation of the said words therefore cannot be wider in clause 4. A restriction can be said to be in the interest of public order only if the connection between the restriction and the public order as direct and proximate is seen. Indirect and unreal connection between the public order and restriction would not fall within the purview of the expression in the interests of public order. The determination by the legislature of what constitutes a reasonable restriction is not final or conclusive. It is subject to supervision by the court. The test of ascertaining the reasonableness of the restriction of the rights in article 19 is of immense relevance. No abstract standard reasonableness can be laid down as applicable to all the cases. The nature of the right alleged to have been infringed, the purpose of the restrictions imposed, the extent and the urgency of the evil sought to be reminded thereby, the disproportion of the imposition and the prevailing conditions at the time should all enter the judicial verdict. Friends, let us now take into consideration some of the principles which the Supreme Court has affirmed in ascertaining the reasonableness of the restrictions when they are put by the legislature or the executive. Number one, reasonableness demands proper balancing. The phrase reasonable restrictions connote that the limitations imposed upon a person in the enjoyment of a right should not be arbitrary or of an excessive nature. A legislation arbitrarily invading the right of a person cannot be regarded as reasonable. A restriction to be valid must have a direct and proximate nexus with the objective which the legislature seeks to achieve and the restriction must not be more than the object that is a balance between the freedoms guaranteed under articles 19.1 a to g and the social control permitted by clauses 2 to 6 of article 19. 
It is the substance of legislation and not its appearance of form which is to be taken into consideration while assessing its validity. This friends introduces the principle of proportionality. It means that the court would consider whether the restrictions imposed by legislation on the fundamental rights are disproportionate to the situation and whether they are not restrictive of the choices. It is the direct inevitable and the real not the remote effect of the legislation on the fundamental right which is to be considered a reasonable restriction must also be consistent with article 14 of the constitution since the restrictions cannot be arbitrary or excessive. Number 2 reasonableness both substantive and procedural. To determine the reasonableness of the restrictions the court should also consider the nature of the restriction and the procedure prescribed by the statute for enforcing such restriction on individual freedom. Not merely substantive but pro procedural provisions of a statute also enter into the verdict of its reasonable uh, of its reasonableness. Retrospectivity of a law may also be a relevant factor although retrospectivity of a law does not make it automatically unreasonable. A statute imposing a restriction with retrospective effect is not prima facie unreasonable but retrospectivity is an element to be taken into consideration in determining whether the restriction is reasonable or not. Number 3 reasonableness as an objective concept. The reasonability of a restriction must be determined in an objective manner. It should be from the standpoint of the public and not from the view of the persons upon which the restrictions are imposed or upon abstract considerations. This concept of object objectivity has prompted the Supreme Court to warn the judges from bringing, bringing their own personal predilections in ascertaining the reasonableness of the restrictions. Number 4 reasonableness of restriction and not of law to be called. The court is asked upon to ascertain the reasonableness of the restriction and not of the law which permits the restriction. A law may be reasonable but the restriction imposed by it on the exercise of freedom may not be reasonable. Number 5 reasonableness and its relation with the directive principles of state policy. The directive principles of state policy are also relevant in considering whether a, whether a restriction on a fundamental right is reasonable or not. A restriction which generally promotes a directive principle is generally regarded as reasonable. The Supreme Court in Kasturi Lal versus the state of Jammu and Kashmir observed that any action taken by the government with the view to give effect to give effect to any one or more of the directive principles and effect would ordinarily qualify for being regarded as reasonable. Number 6 it is the courts and not the legislature which has to decide finally whether a restriction is reasonable or not. There is no general standard or general pattern of reasonableness that can be laid down in all cases. Each case is to be judged on its own merit. The standard varies with the nature of the right infringed the purpose of the restrictions imposed, the extent and the urgency of the evil sought to be rem remedied, the disproportion of the imposition, the prevailing condition at the time to name a few. These factors have to be taken into consideration for any judicial verdict. Friends with this we come to the next part 
which is whether effect or subject matter has to be tested. What is the test to determine whether a law violates article 19 or any other fundamental right? Legislation or a government action may have a direct effect on a fundamental right, although its subject matter may be different. The object of the law or executive action is irrelevant when it infringes a fundamental right, although its subject matter may be different. No law or action will expressly say that it violates a right guaranteed. That is why the courts have to protect fundamental rights by considering the scope and provisions of the act and its effect upon the fundamental right. The effect test has been applied by the Supreme Court in at least one instance that I can think of Menika Gandhi versus Union of India. In another case in R.C. Cooper versus Union of India, the court has made the observation and said that it is the direct operation of the act upon the rights which form the real test. In an earlier opinion in A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, the Supreme Court had applied the test of subject matter to uphold the validity of the Preventive Detention Act against a challenge under Article 19.1a. The effect test gives a greater protection to fundamental rights. It may however be noted that in Bennett Coleman versus Union of India in 1973, the Supreme Court held that effective test is direct effect on a fundamental right which is to be determinative. A difference of judicial opinion is possible on the question whether the effect of a provision on a fundamental right is direct or indirect. Friends, let us now discuss another ground, unreasonability of restrictions. Any law which does not strike a proper balance between the freedoms guaranteed and the social control permitted by the clauses in Article 19 is an unreasonable restriction. In Chintaman Rao versus State of Madhya Pradesh, the central provinces and the Berar regulation of manufacture of BDs for Agriculture Purpose Act of 1948 was questioned as unconstitutional. The act provided that in the agricultural season, no one should engage in the manufacture of BDs. The object of the legislation was to divert the labor engaged in the manufacture of BDs to the agricultural sector where there was a dearth of labor. It was held by the Supreme Court that the legislation in question was not a reasonable restriction upon the freedom of occupation. It was observed that even the persons who could not engage in the hard manual labor necessary in agriculture such as children, the old and the infirm were also prevented in the legislation from making their livelihood in the manufacture of BDs. No alternative provision was contemplated for providing them with work during the period of their enforced idleness. The legislation not only compelled those engaged in agricultural work from taking other avocations, but also prohibited persons with no connection to agriculture to undertake agricultural operations. The legislature thus failed to consider the probable repercussions of the restrictions upon the persons affected by it. The restriction was therefore held to be unreasonable. The legislation was accordingly struck down as unconstitutional. A prohibition on the fundamental right to carry on occupation, trade or business is not regarded as reasonable if it is imposed not in the interests of the public 
but keeping in view the susceptibilities and sentiments of a section of the community. In Muhammad Farooq versus State of Madhya Pradesh, in 1976, the Madhya Pradesh Municipal Corporation Act 1956 made it obligatory upon the corporation to make adequate provisions for the construction, maintenance and regulation of a slaughterhouse. Section 432 authorized the government to modify or repeal any bylaws made by the corporation. Therefore, acting under section 432, the government by a notification cancelled the bylaws made by the Jabalpur municipality relating to bulls and bullocks, which prohibited the slaughter of such animals. It was held by the Supreme Court that such notification infringed the fundamental right of the petitioner guaranteed under Article 19.1 G as the power to cancel the bylaws cannot be exercised in an arbitrary manner. It was observed that the sentiments of a section of a community may be hurt by permitting the slaughter of bulls and bullocks. However, a prohibition imposed on the exercise of fundamental right to carry on an occupation, trade or business will not be regarded as reasonable if it is imposed not in the interest of public, but merely to respect the susceptibilities and sentiments of the section of a people whose way of life, belief or thought is not the same as that of the claimant. A law which confers arbitrary and uncontrolled power upon the executive in the matter of regulation, trade, regulation of trade or business cannot be held reasonable. This was held in Dwarka Prasad versus State of Uttar Pradesh. The court in the case observed that the licensing authority may grant or refuse to grant, renew or refuse to renew a license and may sustain, cancel, revoke or modify any license or any terms thereof granted by him under the order for reasons to be recorded, provided that every power which is under the order exercisable by the state coal controller or any person authorized by him on his behalf. Section 4, Clause 3 of the UP Coal Control Order 1953 was therefore declared void because it gave unrestrained authority to a single individual to grant, withhold or cancel licenses in any way he chooses. And there was nothing in the order which could ensure a proper execution of the power to operate as a check on the injustice that might result from the improper execution of the same power. Therefore, where the power is conferred on the executive to regulate and control the exercise of the freedom conferred by Article 19.1 G, it is necessary that the law which does so should either lay down the circumstances or grounds on which the power may be exercised. An act which vests discretionary powers on an executive should also give sufficient guidance in the matter of the exercise of such discretionary powers so as to sustain reasonableness of the restriction. However, it is not necessary that such guidance of policy should be expressly and specifically stated. It is enough if such guidance can be found on a fair reading of the act and other concerning circumstances. Freak friends, we can conclude here by saying that any restriction which to maintain public order in the sense public peace or safety are in the interests of the general public. 
but the restrictions should be reasonable. The restrictions that put the rights guaranteed within the social controls permitted under clauses 2 to 6 are reasonable. The expression used in article 19 2 in the interest of give wide amplitude to the permissible law which can be enacted to impose reasonable restrictions on the right guaranteed by article 19 1 a under one of the heads mentioned in article 19 2. No restriction can be placed by the right to freedom of speech and expression on any ground other than those specified in article 19 2. Every legislation is set with the aim of achieving an objective and in achieving those objects the legislation should not arbitrarily invade upon the rights of a citizen. The restrictions should look at the set objects that the legislation seeks to achieve and it should establish a close link with such object of the legislation. If the close proximate effect of the law is that it abridges the fundamental rights of the citizens and if the restriction prevents such abridgment then the restriction is reasonable. On the other hand if the restriction goes too far in linking itself with the object of the legislation then such a restriction is unreasonable. Another important test is if a said provision or a right shows clear sign of danger or even shows an apprehended danger then a restriction on such a law is reasonable. With this we come to an end of this lecture. Friends, I thank you all for your patient hearing.